I imagine that you were probably working on some routines or a piece, and at some point during your involvement of Cirque du Soleil, someone must have said, hey, do you want to develop something? Or you maybe said, hey, I want to show you this, and then they see it, they like it, you begin working on it together, and there's an establishment of trust. I mean, what was that process for you when you, you kind of made that leap into sort of, you know, you know, a soloist or a part of a clown troupe where you were really developing your own material? Well, again, I was lucky with Cirque. I, I had reached a certain um, level in, in my professional career as a solo performer. And it was around that time that I auditioned for Cirque du Soleil. And they brought me on. I, I auditioned without the material, the pre-existing material that I had. Uh, I auditioned, basically was put through a, you know, the paces uh, with their auditioners. Um, and it was, it was a dance audition, actually, that I did. Um, so it was very movement-based, of course. Uh, and I can't dance. <laughs> so again, it, it, you know, that's the thing about the clown. It's the attempt to do something. You know, we were trying to define it earlier, but the attempt to do something is much more interesting than being able to do something. So the clown is, um, is always resting or it always has one foot in failure and one foot in success. Uh, they when they're at their best, they're succeeding uh, by failing. So anyway, because of the circumstance of the audition being uh, for dancers and me being the only guy who wasn't a dancer, I was put into a comic situation which really worked well for me and they, they liked it. They responded very strongly to it and they hi hired me a year later. And even though they said in the beginning, we don't want you to do any of your pre-existing material, we, we're gonna just shape something with you, something new, uh, in the end, they did include my pre-existing material. And so they saw me from the beginning as a creator, um, all of this stuff that I already had under my belt, which I was able to build on for future shows, uh, four or three subsequent shows after the first one. Right. And it's taken you kind of into the Hollywood realm too, right? I was reading about your involvement with Ratatouille and, and physical movement. Yeah, although uh, it's actually Emeryville is where Pixar is, so it's in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, but yeah, I went in, uh, one of the guys who's, uh, who was the head of the storyboard department for Pixar, and that's where much of the writing actually happens, uh, is the storyboard artists. They knew they wanted to do a lot of physical stuff, physical comedy for Ratatouille, but they were having trouble finding a way to write it. They were having trouble visualizing gags, so they brought me in, and I... And I sort of uh, improvised several different characters for, I think I just did one or two days, um, went through a few different routines, uh, trying stuff out. It wasn't uh, motion captured. Pixar never does that. I wasn't wearing one of the little suits with the ping pong balls. I was just doing my stuff and they were both videotaping me and uh, sketching as I was playing. That is amazing. It was super cool. <laughs> You've seen probably so many clowns, so many routines, so many personalities. Do you still find yourself being surprised? Uh, <laughs> honestly, it's, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at a tough period with it, both performing it and watching it. I'm, um, I, maybe that's it, is that I'm not surprised. I'm not surprising myself, and I'm not being surprised when I see other people. And it's kind of bumming me out. I don't know what it is. I love Clown, you know, and I think, I think there's something very special about it. I think it's, there, you know, there, there is an archetype, you know, there's the clown archetype and is that sense that it's um, universal and uh, timeless. And so it's valuable. And we've got, I'd say, successful clowns today, not many, but we have a few. And so, so for example, in, in my book, you know, Stephen Colbert and, and uh, John Stewart are, are great. You know, Stephen Colbert in particular plays the idiot who exposes. We were talking about the trickster. He's the, he's the guy who exposes the truth, or truthiness, I guess, in his word. And he's also a bit of the jester. And he's, so he's, he's speaking the truth right when we need it, particularly, you know, like during the Bush administration or right. about the, the super PACs that he was covering this last year. For me, that's clown. And so, so there I'm impressed, and there I'm inspired with those guys, or guys like Will Ferrell or Zach Galifianakis. For me, they play the clown archetype, these guys. Yeah. 
taking a darker look at, at the, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's continue on this vein. Certainly we have a lot of clowns in American culture, you know, from Ronald McDonald to Insane Clown Posse, Batman's The Joker, John Wayne Gacy. We have, a, you know, a lot of clowns that are, are of that darker archetype. In terms of the degradation, the darkness, the anarchy, is there, you know, what is the, the clown's relationship to those things and what's his role in that? Oh, let's see, that might be a hard one for me because I don't see clown in those things that you mentioned. Just because they have the makeup and the, you know, the, the sort of typical American clown look, that, you know, I'm going to offend some people, but that's not significant of clown in any way for me. A clown might have that, okay, but just because they have that makeup, that means nothing to me. I could maybe partly answer your question why it grabs us. Well, it's just a matter of juxtaposition that we have this in our culture, in the American culture, and this is just in America, by the way. Well, maybe not just, but it's, it's, it's stronger in America than other places. The, the, uh, the association of this, of this makeup and fright wig as a clown is, is a child's uh, entertainer. So anytime you juxtapose that with something that's more adult, then you have uh, attention there, which is going to be interesting and going to draw attention. So that's just basic gimmickry, if you ask me. The fact that somebody like John Wayne Gacy was wearing a clown costume scares the living shit out of me, not because he's a clown, just because it's freaky. I mean, I'm freaked out by that. I'm freaked out by um, Ronald McDonald. I guess because maybe in that case, it's the antithesis to what I'm looking for, you know, in clown. Ronald McDonald is a facade. It's a, it's a happy face platitude, you know, walking around uh, to sell something. I, I, you couldn't be further from what the value, the value of an actual archetypal clown is. This is what, that, that stuff pisses me off because it reinforces the misconception of, of what clown is. And I want to find a new word for it so we can talk about it to people without having to like go through this explanation. The clown archetype, it, again, is something that society needs. It needs those who are willing to reveal themselves and what's off in society through comedy, through laughter. And now you've come up with a workshop that you're teaching in Hollywood called The Fool. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what your goals are for that, for the students? So again, we come back in a way to the definition of, of clown. And I feel often when I go see comic performers, whether it's in improv or stand-up comedians or, uh, you know, even sometimes just seeing people in, on, in film or television, I feel like, the, feel like there's a lot of comic performers who are a little bit lost. Those that have something special to offer seem to really be able to share their vulnerability in a comic manner. I, I guess I feel like a lot of people are putting something on when they perform and when they're trying to be funny. Like they're adopting somebody else's vibe or somebody else's point of view or, or somebody else's voice. But, that, but I'm trying to find, in the workshop, we're just trying to find each individual's own comic voice. And I don't, I don't mean just literally their vocal voice, but their physicality, their point of view, all of that stuff. I feel like everybody's got the potential, everybody's got the potential to be super funny. And that there's a, there's a, there's just sort of a zone there, you know, there's a, there's a sweet spot where if you can find that, then that person is really going to just sing when they're on stage. But at, in, in essence, there's something just super, super funny about everybody. And most of us spend most of our time trying to cover it up because that's what, that's what modern society is asking you to do from a young age. You're taught to blend in and not to upset things. You follow along. You got baby gap so you can get your kid in the right clothes when they're a baby. Uh, you know, wh when can you be yourself? The, the number one question in the workshop is, and I learned this from Franco Dragone, who directed all the Cirque du Soleil shows up until like 2000. Who are you? The, the question is, who are you? That's the question for everybody in the class. Who are you? And all I want to do is uncover the funniest parts of you, get you to, to accept those and to build on those things that make you an idiot. Because we're all fucking 
fucking idiots. And it's much more fun to be a fucking idiot than to be a guy trying to disguise your idiocy. So that's where I get, that's why when I talk about clown, it's a little bit of a philosophy for me because it's getting into tune with, with those really important parts of being, being a person, which is, which is the mistakes and the idiocy and, uh, and the desire to shake things up, the desire to, to change things. That's that sense of anarchy that the clown has. Thank you very much. I'm with John Gilkey in his backyard, just us and the crickets. <laughs> and uh, this has been great. Thank you so much for talking to me. You bet. My pleasure. And uh, this is The Sounds of L.A.